This week's guest is another trip to HR for me. Imagine that, right? But we, we've ended up here for a different reason. Julie Sumner, as she started out as an attorney, ended up in HR. There's a, a, a long and winding path there, but she ended up in HR as the owner of Monarch Endeavors. And yes, that brought here her here into the studio, into this very seat. She's not here today, but she will be in a way. Um, we're going to cover a bit of her journey and maybe we'll figure out if I get to keep my job or not after this visit with HR. Stay tuned. Julie, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You say you are a recovering lawyer, but you were told from the time that you were a young, a youngster that you should be a lawyer. Is this, I mean, were you the argumentative kid? I mean, how did that story come about? I don't believe that I was argumentative because I really don't like confrontation or arguing with people. But from what I was told, I always had something to say. <laughs> and I always, I did like to prove my points. And I, from a very young age, found that I fit in better with the adults than the kids. So I like to have conversations and and talk to the adults more than I did like hanging out and playing games with people my own age, so. It, it's funny because now, I don't know about you, but for me, instead of hanging out with the adults, now I, I, as a kid, I liked hanging out with the adults. Now as an adult, I'd rather much rather play with the kids. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's definitely so. You start in college, it said you ended up taking like a social work path and you ended up in Detroit doing social work for four years. And that was originally planned as one. I mean, did three years just disappear in a vacuum? Did you, I mean, wake up one day and like, where did three years go? What, I, I, give me a little bit of the social work story there, if you would, please. Sure. So when I graduated, I was really torn between social work and law. So at that time, and I lived in Michigan, and at that time in Michigan, you could get a social work degree without having to get a master. So you could just get enough hours that you could get your license. So I shouldn't have said degree. You could get a licensure for um, a social work. And so I decided I was going to do that because I couldn't make up my mind. So I thought, well, we'll get some experience and see what happens. So I worked the hours, got my license in social work and had some crazy jobs, saw some crazy things. <laughs> Uh, and then, yes, three, I mean, four years went by faster than I would have expected. Uh, but I think probably around year three is when I started realizing something started pulling at me again. And I thought, uh, if I don't go to law school, I'm really going to regret it. So I started looking in my third year out. And then by end of year four, I was off to Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> so you ended up a case, correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, so you go through case, you become a lawyer. Um, knowing how researched you are, because watching you guys, and we're going to get to some of this in a minute. And also, I wanted to take a step back. You're saying you've seen some crazy things. That seems to, as well as I've gotten to know you, that seems to be a theme of, of what you do. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying, that seems to be that theme there. So, but first off, knowing how well-researched you are when it comes to this stuff, I do not want to be an opposing lawyer against you. <laughs> just no. um, but you've mentioned that, like when you were a lawyer, you felt like it was damage control in so many cases. Um, is that where Monarch started to come out of the, did it come out of the cocoon? Um, how was that bad? That was bad. <laughs> was that where it started to come out of? Yes, it was kind of two things happening at once. So one, I was getting very tired of how reactive litigation is because yes, by the time a client got to me, the lawsuit had been filed. There wasn't anything we could do to change it other than hopefully do some damage control around how much they might have to pay, maybe get the lawsuit thrown out, but they're still spending, you know, 
tens of thousands of dollars on legal fees just to get the law suit thrown out. So that was a big part of it. The other part of it was that my father had gotten sick and then he had passed. And, you know, when when someone who's been a really critical part of your life passes away, you start to look at things differently. And I hadn't been super happy or jazzed up about going into work um, in a while. I had, uh, you know, the schmun days where you're like, oh boy, you know, here we go again. Um, and so I had been thinking about leaving, but I couldn't quite decide what to do. So I had interviewed for various types of jobs, didn't like any of them. And then I, uh, my dad, after he passed, he would send me monarch butterflies. That was his sign to me that he was still around. And so when I had the idea to start my own firm, I was driving down the expressway, oddly enough, going to a father's friend's funeral. And it just sort of hit me like, oh my God, I should just start my own training and consulting company because those are the things that I love to do the most. And as I thought it, a monarch butterfly flew across my windshield. And I was like, okay, that's it. And so that's also how the name came to be. That 100% makes sense and is very, very cool. That's a, I love that story. That, that's so cool. So when you started this, is this, I, I, I don't want to say started on a wing and a prayer, but <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm rolling right really bad with the puns today. But really, I mean, when you started this and I, I mean, in, in having get getting to know you through the studio and stuff like that, you're not someone that's just like, ah, throw caution to the wind. I mean, you do HR stuff. Um, <laughs> there's not a lot of that in there. Um, I mean, what made you think, yes, this is going to be successful? How did, how did you think this is how we're going to move this forward? So again, it was a combination of factors. So one was I had become a partner in my law firm. I'd been a partner for a few years. And this is not to say anything bad about my partners because they're all lovely people. But when I saw how they made business decisions and kind of more what was involved about like looking at the finances and, and really getting a handle on how you, all the things you need to do to run a business, I started to realize like, oh, I, I can do this. You know, if they can do it, I can do it. Why not? What's the difference? Earth. So that was a big part of it. And then the other part was I couldn't have done it if my husband had, uh, still husband. I was going <laughs> to, as I was talking, it was like husband at the time, but that sounds weird. I just meant at the time, my husband, um, first of all, was very supportive. And second, still had like, we had health insurance through him. So that was a big part of me being able to sort of go out on my own. But I had come home. I had also been having some health issues. And so I had come home in like January and said, I don't need you to answer me right now, but I need you to tell me what would make you comfortable enough so that I can quit my job because it's literally killing me. Right. <laughs> and right. he was like, can you make it till July? And I was like, yep. And so we then we started planning. We I socked away a bunch of money. I uh, set up a bunch of training gigs so that I would have some income coming in. And then I uh, left my law firm on June 30th of 2016 and started Monarch on July 1st of 2016. <laughs> <laughs> to the day. To July. the day. <laughs> July? Well, how's June 30th? <laughs> <laughs> and you probably got your last paycheck a couple of days. You got your last paycheck yep. in July, right? So, yeah, you made it to July. Yep, yep. Why HR? That that's the big question. It, it's a field that people are either drawn to, or that people like me run from, um, because it's it's usually it's when I hear my full name, like my mother screaming at me. It's usually that is what I would usually get from HR. So why HR? What was the draw to HR? A big part of it is that I did labor and employment litigation, so I had all that knowledge and experience, but also. I mean, HR is just fascinating. People are fascinating. The things that people do, 
especially in the workplace. (laughs) (laughs) It's never boring and you will always have job security. So we're, we're, we're going to come back to that in a minute because there, there's, <laughs> I, I don't want to lose that thread. Um, but I do want to ask about another couple of things. So you guys actually do a podcast. You've got yes. the uh, Wine with HR, correct? Where yes. you and Trish sample a wine, um, maybe, maybe multiple samples. Um, it's still a sample, right? Yes. Sample size is relevant, um, <laughs> ir- irrelevant. So, um, y- and you guys talk about HR issues and work through that and talk to people. So what, I guess, what's been your favorite part about that, doing that podcast? It's just so much fun. So I had been looking for ways to add more fun things to do into my work life. Uh, you know, being a business owner, sometimes you're just, there's a lot of stuff that's not fun that you have to do. <laughs> just so, little, yep, fine. just a little bit. So I was like, what can I do that I'm really going to enjoy? And how can I do more of that with people that I really enjoy being with? And so that was kind of how the podcast came about. And then Trisha and I just both really enjoy wine. So then we decided well, we got to incorporate wine somehow. And then I came up with the title Wine with HR, the W-H-I-N-E, but we also drink the W-I-N-E. Uh, and it's just been a lot of fun, like getting to do the all the various topics. And uh, I think I told you, I, I feel like I was probably a DJ in a past life because I really enjoy just <laughs> talking and nobody can tell me to shut up. That's really nice. Yeah, I was going to say, so this has to be different because you kind of, you're you're kind of more of the point person on the show, whereas today you're on my show, so you got to yeah. be like, oh, this is weird. This is the other chair. I don't know about this. Um, that, that's, what has been, what have you learned in doing your podcast? Editing is a beautiful thing. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Yes, it is. It is a tool that can be absolutely amazing. Did I say that? Nope, I sure didn't. Or did I say that? The only people that are ever going to know that are the ones in this room. Yes. Wholeheartedly get that. So speaking of editing, you guys have a course that you're going to release coming up in a couple of months, probably. Um, we're doing some of the editing for that now. You guys did that in the studio where there was a PowerPoint up here on the screen right behind me, and you guys went through your course. How did you feel that went? Uh, first of all, it's courses, multiple, multiple courses. <laughs> yes. yes. There, I lumped them all into one thing, yes. just out of self-preservation. Yes, yes, I believe we spent eight days in the studio, eight or nine, something like that. Yes. Um, So, you know what? I thought it was great. I thought it was not as painful as I anticipated. Because when you think, yes, when you think about, oh, dear Lord, we're going to turn 20 trainings into online courses and we have to record ourselves through all of those, you kind of want to vomit. (laughs) <laughs> you know? uh, so there was no vomiting at least no. i don't think so not no. on my part anyway <laughs> i never had to pull a birth bag out i never had, there was no no cleanup on aisle five in the studio went really well from that aspect so yeah yes. i'm especially i'm kind of sensitive to that so yeah i'm glad there was none of that <laughs> uh but it also is very different you know i think we talked about this when i was there a couple days like I do a ton of live trainings and when you're doing it live, you just got to go with the flow. And if you screw up, you just sort of keep on plugging along and, and figure it out. And the recording gives you the ability to be much more um, precise in what you're saying. Uh, But it can also get frustrating because sometimes you just cannot get the words out. (laughs) Because you've got the producer, this guy, sitting behind the desk going, do it again, do it again, do it again. 
And it's funny because that was the theme with our last guest also when we talked about Chrissy doing her book. It was the same thing. It was do it again, do it again. Um, thankfully, somehow, none of you ever got stabby in the studio. <laughs> Um, I always joke that these studios are padded rooms. Um, thankfully, no one ac actually lost their mind in here, um, at least any more than they already had ahead of time. That was the <laughs> um, wh When it came to that, you guys, you're doing these courses. Where'd that idea come from? A couple things. A lot of it was from COVID. So during, during COVID, we had to switch a lot of our live trainings to virtual live trainings, uh, just like everybody else, you know, Zoom became our best friend. But we have a lot of clients who either have multiple shifts or people in multiple time zones. And logistically, it can be a real challenge for them to get you know, 20 to 100 people together for a live training, especially since some of the ones we do are two days live. So that's a lot. Oh, that's wow. a big chunk of time, you know, um, <laughs> even even for like a three hour training. Sometimes that's really difficult for organizations to be able to pull everybody together. So we thought, well, if we have these online options, then they can still have people take them as a group. Like, let's take our manager boot camp, for example. That's typically a two-day live course. So now it's recorded. It'll be probably like take somebody eight to 12 hours to go through all the material, depending how quickly they go. But a company could still have, you know, 50 to 100 of their managers take it at the same time, like over the same, let's say, a month. And we can say, okay, before week two, everybody gets the first X modules done. And then we'll have a virtual session with me or Trisha, and we can do role plays, answer questions, dive a little bit deeper into the material. Then you'll do the next half before the month is up. But it's still, so it's it's a nice hybrid of both, but it gives them more flexibility because then managers can watch the videos and go through the material as they have time without having to have these huge chunks of time that they have to be available. Sure. No, that makes perfect sense. Although I have to say when you said a three hour course, um, the, I started singing the theme to Gilligan's <laughs> Island in my head. <laughs> um, <laughs> suddenly I was stuck on a deserted island with a professor <laughs> and, and, and yeah, the, and the howls. Um, so, I mean, the, to me, having you guys in the studio was great. And it was interesting. Uh, I, I joke that I am now an HR professor of sorts um, because I have seen all of these trainings four and five times as not only you guys read them a couple of times, but we've now edited them a couple of times. And we're still in process of that as we speak. So I, I think I, I'm not going to get any SHRM certifications here or anything <laughs> like that, but... I feel like I could take a couple of the tests and maybe do better than some of the HR managers out there today. So, the, it, and those are the ones that need to take your course then. <laughs> that being said, what I, I've, this is one of the questions that I've been just dying to ask. What is one of your weirdest and or best HR stories that you can talk about publicly because I know sometimes you gotta you gotta be like this is hilarious I can't tell anyone. Uh, so what is one of the ones that publicly you can say? And I mean, like I said, obviously we'll 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 remove names to protect the innocent. Yes. Well, the one that comes to mind is a client of mine recently had a candidate who they had made an offer to. And uh, about a week went by and, and through their uh, HRIS system, they can see when somebody has opened up an offer letter and this person had not yet opened up the offer letter. And so they reached out to the person who had recommended hiring this person, who had interviewed this person, you know, and, and said, hey, have you heard from them? Because they haven't even opened the offer letter yet. And that uh, manager said, oh, well, let me call this person and see what they say. And so he calls the candidate. The candidate replies with like, oh, I had the wrong email on my resume, which red flag number one. Okay. 
So then he's the manager contacts HR and says, well, he had the wrong resume or the wrong email on his resume. So just send everything to his wife. And they, of course, said, no, we're not going to do that. Like, she's not <laughs> who we're making a job offer to. He can make a free email on Gmail or Yahoo or whatever, you know, like tell him to create a new email and then we'll email him all the stuff. So we get through that little wrinkle. And then um, they always have orientation at the headquarters. And so it comes time for this guy's orientation and he shows up with his wife at the orientation. And they were like, so dumbstruck. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, we've all we we all know people that have the the shared Facebook profile. Yeah. Um, that that's. I mean, if that's what someone wants to do, that's fine. But I don't know if I would share the job. Right. Well, and then when they kind of asked, like, what? Not to be rude, but why is she here? You know. I feel. He, he re his response was, "Well, I do the work work, and she does the paperwork." And it was like, no, oh. that's that's not going to work. <laughs> oh. And this was for a higher level position. This was like for a management level position. Oh, no. wow. No. No, no. no. I, I, how, how does... Yeah, I, it's, I, it's I, kind of like things. bringing your mother to the, an interview or orientation or, you know, I've heard of that too. I, I have not had that happen, but I've heard of that multiple times. I, I just can't even imagine thinking, hey, this is the, we're a package deal. Right. I mean, I have presented stuff to, to companies before, like, look, if you hire us to do this, like, I mean, in us editing your course, you're getting me, you're getting my editor, you're getting the, the, another audio person, you're getting all those things, but we didn't show up for an interview. Right. <laughs> 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 the, 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 I mean, I didn't ask for three orientation packets from you. I didn't ask for, um, that seems a little strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to respond to that one. Um, that, that is strange. Mm -hmm. Well, and neither did the HR people, which I can't blame them for. So they just kind of let it go. Uh, but <laughs> to no one's surprise, this particular person did not last six months. I, I just, at that point, as HR, I got to be I, like, if I'm sitting down across the table from him, I got to be like, so do I have to fire both of you? Or is this, just the, <laughs> I mean, for IT, IT, do I have to give both of you access? Are you, but I mean, how are you going to use the same computer? Are you using the left half of the keyboard? Are you using the right half? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, Wow. Yeah. Wow. Th this to me solidifies your reason of saying there's always something unique. Mm -hmm. There's always something different. People are uh, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's yeah. to me, it's, it's the, it, it's funny because it, it, to me, it's that commonality that you and I have. For me, one of the reasons why I love having people in the podcast studio, what I love to hear from people is the stories. Always amazing. There's always so many cool things. Every, every person has a story somewhere. Um, you obviously enjoy those too. Um, some of these stories are kind of comedic. Yes. Um, especially when you're coming in as the consultant, not as the actual HR person, because you yes. can look at this from a little bit of a distance and be like, okay, here's the paperwork you need to do. You're the one that needs to keep the straight face, yeah. not me. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, wonderful. Julie, I really want to thank you for your time this afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate you guys having come in to the studio and use that for doing the uh, courses. Those, I mean, so well structured, so well put together. I learned an incredible amount of HR and ironically, you guys paid me to do, to take your course, and, <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, for everyone out there, thank you for tuning in. This is yet another great way that the studios can be used. Another way that we have fun with them and 
frankly, part of the reason why I enjoy doing all of this. As I always like to say, do me a favor, take care of yourself. And if you can take care of someone else, I will see you very soon.